morning. Wow, small group at church today. You would think there was a football game on or something. But you know, we have no excuse in Hawaii. I remember growing up, people would miss church on Sunday night because of the because of the Super Bowl. But really, it's not on until the afternoon here, so there's no excuse. People are going to parties or whatever. Today we're going to focus and we're going to think about times of testing that happen in our lives. We're going to look at that as we're thinking about communion this morning. Let's pray. Precious Jesus, we love you so much. We thank you this morning for your word and for your will in our lives, even when it includes times that we're tested and trials that show up. We pray that you would help us, that you would use those times to build our faith, to help us to carry on, to help us learn about you and ourselves. We love you and we thank you this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, if you've been following along with your Bible reading plan, oh, if you've been following your Bible reading plan, then you have been reading... Leviticus, and hopefully you're persevering through the book of the laws, and some may be hard for us to understand about being clean or unclean, different things, and which foods we could eat or not back then in, in the Jewish culture, but Leviticus actually starts in the book with requirements for various kinds of offerings. There was like a burnt offering. A burnt offering, there were grain offerings, fellowship offerings, sin and guilt offerings. Now today we focus on communion, we're focusing on an offering that has been given for us instead of us. It's not an offering we bring, but an offering that God himself provided for us to be in our place. And if we read in Hebrews chapter 10, go ahead and look up there for a minute. Verses 11 through 14, it says, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, meaning who? Meaning Jesus. When this priest has offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So Jesus presents this sacrifice, and I think next week we're going to take a closer look at Hebrews chapter 10 and think about that sacrifice and what it means. But today we're just going to focus on why this sacrifice was provided to us and, and we're going to look at trials and, and things that come up and how testing teaches us about ourselves and about God. And we're going to look at the life of Abraham. But first, let's remind ourselves of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. So that's, what, that's why God provided the sacrifice, because of his love for us. And if we look in the Bible, we see an example in the life of Abraham, of another father who dearly loved his son Isaac. So we're going to look at Abraham's test this morning. So Abraham was tested in Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 2. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, 
and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Anybody here like to have tests? Did you like, Lisa, you liked growing up, you liked tests? Who hated tests? <laughs> oh, I know. No, you're changing your yeah. mind? Okay. Now, you hate why, both? It depended on the subject, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, I can understand yeah. that. I mean, English tests for me were fine, but math tests, ooh, I hate it, right? Yeah, same for me. Well, same for Viola, too. Okay, and why do we hate tests? Well, it's problem. <laughs> Word problems? Oh, for, in math? Yeah, you can't figure out, you know, maybe it's not a good subject for you, or you can't. Really, it's the possibility of failure, right? We don't like the possibility. But how many of you have taken a test before and you thought, oh, this is easy, I can pass this, and then later you get it back and you maybe you got a C or a D or an F. And what happened? I thought I was ready, but I wasn't ready for that test. I failed it. What happened? So sometimes we learn, oh, I didn't know as much about that subject as I thought. I thought it would be easy. I thought I knew everything. But we find out we didn't know. So sometimes our tests... And even if we fail, even if we struggle, they can teach us about ourselves and the things, the areas in our life that God is working on and God is trying to help us to grow in and build up. And the thing is, like, like we were saying, you know, if, if I had a math test in front of me or an English test in front of me, I'm going to choose the English test yeah. to try, right? If I had a choice, I'm going to choose it. I'm, I'm not going to choose the math. However, in our Christian life and our relationship with God, we can't choose our test. He does. He chooses which tests. And he knows the areas that need to be stronger and that he needs to test us in. You know, unfortunately, I would like to be able to, te to choose all the tests I knew I was going to pass easily. But God often chooses the harder tests for our lives. And here, I'm sure Abraham didn't like this test. His, his dear son Isaac, that God said, this is the son, not Ishmael, but this is the son Isaac, and here he calls him your only son. This is the son of the promise. This is the son that Abraham's going to become a father of many nations through him. And here God is saying, take this son up to the mountain, sacrifice him in a burnt offering. <coughs> So I'm sure Abraham probably wanted to say, ooh, I don't like that test. That's not a test I would have chosen. And, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, Lord, don't test me in that area. Don't test, test me over here. I'll be fine. I'll pass that. But don't test me in this area of my life. I wonder what would have happened if Job could have seen the conversation that happened in heaven on the day the angels came before the Lord. It says in Job, sorry, Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 says, One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And then you know the story goes on, and Satan accuses God of protecting Job. And so God says, fine, I'm not going to protect him. Go ahead, you can attack him. We know what happens after that. And it's like God is saying, bring it on. Bring it on to Satan, right? And we sometimes are like, ooh, we don't want God to say that about our lives. We don't want God to say, Satan, go ahead, test my child. But why does God say it then? God knows that with him, we can pass the test. We can have victory. We can succeed. And I think God likes to boast about his kids. Now, we boast in the Lord and not ourselves. But I think God is like a proud dad in heaven sometimes. And he knows you can pass that test. You can be victorious. You can succeed. You, you won't get an F. Just trust me. Depend on me. 
And that's how we learn about God in our test. We learn that God is faithful. We learn we can trust him and depend on him because he's there in the test with us. And he helps us. And I think sometimes God wants to boast about us. And we say, well, don't talk about me with Satan. You know, don't, don't say bring it on to him. But, you know, it's, it's almost like the picture of, of like the dad who has a kid who's like sitting on the bench. And there's a big game. Like we have football games. I, I know my kid. He can, he, can, he can score that touchdown or whatever. He can, he can play well. And says, coach, send him in. My son, he can. And I almost get that image sometimes of God saying, you can. You can succeed. You can pass this test. You are strong enough with me to make it. We pass the test and we build our faith and perseverance and we learn more about who God is and how he will provide for us. And oftentimes the tests, you know, sometimes the tests, they are too much for us to bear. Many times the tests are too much for us to bear. Because God is trying to teach us to give them to him, to lean on him, to let him bear them with us. Amen? And, and Ernest, you had a good question today about, well, does Satan tempt us? Or, you know, you know is God tempting us? Is Satan, who's in control? Right. Right. We know in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, oh wait, no, chapter 10, verse 13. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to us all. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So we're not going to be tempted beyond what we can bear. Okay? And that's an important that's an important distinction. Testing and temptation are different. I don't have this next in the overhead, but I want to read because you reminded me of another verse. If we read in James chapter 1, I'll just pick a few verses. Verse 2 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish its work so that you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. <coughs> and if we go down to verse 13, it says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he has his own evil desires. He is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Dad, my first. James 1, verses 2 through 3, and verse, and I think verse 13, 14. and testing are different. Today we're more focused on the kind of testing that builds our, that builds our faith in God. Temptation is not going to be beyond what we can bear. But sometimes testing can be because it's teaching us about God to depend on Him to let Him provide for us. Now, was Abraham's test easy? Was it something he could do easily on his own? I don't think so. And if we if we look in Hebrews chapter 11, it gives us an idea of what was going on in Abraham's mind. Because I don't think, you know, if, if a parent is told to bring their child, their precious child, and offer them up to God as a burnt offering, that doesn't even match what God seems like in Scripture, right? So this was not an easy test. But Hebrews chapter 11 lets us know how Abraham was thinking. It says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises 
was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So in a manner of speaking, he did, he did receive Isaac back from death. So Abraham knew the promise. He, he trusted. He believed God's promises about Isaac and that Abraham himself would become a great nation through this son. And he, what was he thinking? Even if I go and offer my son, God can raise him up. God will keep his promise to me to make me a great nation through him. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know what's going to happen on the mountain, but I trust God that he can even raise him from the dead. If he needs to. That's <coughs> it. Me. Thank you. So because Abraham trusted God, he obeyed him. He didn't hesitate. He just went ahead in his obedience. Jesus here is talking to the, the chief priests and the elders in the temple courts. 
and he's saying there are, there are tax collectors, there are people that cheated other people, that basically stole from them being a tax collector. There are prostitutes. Because of their belief and their obedience, they're going to heaven before you, the religious leaders and teachers, because they're being obedient to God. They're like that first son who said, I don't want to go. But then later he said, fine, I'm going to go and work in my father's vineyard. And he's saying the religious leaders and teachers were saying, oh, yeah, we will go. We will obey God. But then when John came preaching the message of repentance and about Jesus coming, preparing the way for him, those religious leaders and teachers like, no, we don't believe. So be careful in your decisions and in your obedience to God. Abraham had those three days where he could have decided, you know what? He could have said, you know what? To a servant, go and catch an animal. Let's build an altar right here and we'll sacrifice this animal. And then he could have gone back and nobody would have known the difference. The two servants wouldn't have known that he's disobeying God. His son wouldn't have known that he's disobeying God. He had three days and he had to persevere that through that test to go up to the mountain. So we need to be careful in our obedience. It's better to say, I don't want to obey. And then you go ahead and obey. Than it is to say, oh yes, Lord, I will follow you. I will trust you. I will serve you. I will persevere. I will obey. And then later say, it's too hard. I can't do it. I'm going to quit church. Or quit ministry. Or quit whatever God is telling us to do. If we look at the third point, Abraham's blessing, God's provision, what God provided. The end of the story in Genesis, chapter 22, verses 11 through 18 says, But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Don't lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth, on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Trust him through the test. It's not easy. We don't pick our own tests. God picks them. But we have to trust him that he knows what he's doing. And he will help us. He will give us what we need to persevere. And it will result in a blessing for our lives and for our families and for the people around us. God provided the sacrifice and all nations on earth were blessed because Abraham obeyed God. And that's our challenge with the tests we face. Will we continue to obey Him? And today as we think about and focus on communion, I wanted to think about communion. Think about, and, and I think everyone here has probably already believed in Jesus as their Savior. But maybe think about this for the people you know that aren't saved, how you can pray for them. Because you know what, we've all been given a test. Everyone, you know, our, our test through our Christian life and maturing and walking with God may be different for each one of us. Some are tested financially, some are tested physically, some are tested maybe through their relationships, in their marriages. There's maybe all different tests we've been given. but. Humanity as a whole is given one test, and that is 
How are we entering heaven? What are we doing with Jesus Christ? Do we have eternal life? How? Are we ready? Is everyone, are we ready? Are we fit to enter heaven? And that means measuring up to God's standard, what he says, who he says can have eternal life. And the thing about this test is I can let you know right now, on our own, we fail. But you know what? Everybody has already failed this test. Romans 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, in Christ Jesus our Lord. All have sinned. All of us have already earned eternal death and separation from God. And it's the same for our friends and our families and everyone we know. All of mankind has failed this test. But just like God provided that ram for Abraham to use as a sacrifice, God has provided his son to forgive, to cover up our sin. And like we read John 3, 16 before, let's continue, let's read 16 through 18. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So there's two kinds of whoever's. There's the whoever that believes in Jesus and the whoever that doesn't and that's, that's already condemned before God. And if you're the wrong kind of whoever this morning, I'm going to challenge you. Believe Jesus. Become the other kind of whoever. The person that believes Jesus. That has their sins forgiven. Because what is the result of that? Our blessing. Again, God's provision. Just as God provided the sacrifice for Abraham, he has provided the sacrifice for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us. And this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And you know what, next week I think we're going to delve deeper into Hebrews chapter 10 and think about even more. And we, we may go ahead and receive communion again next week. I'm, I'm thinking about doing that at the beginning of service because God just showed you. Sometimes you know how you read the Bible and you see a verse in a whole different way that happened to me this week. But God said I'm, I'm supposed to save it and hold it for next week. So hopefully everyone comes back and more come next week because it's just beautiful something that God showed me about communion and about the temple and what it, what it meant for us to have, what it means for us to have Jesus as our sacrifice. In Luke chapter 22, verses 19 through 20, it says, Jesus took bread, he gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Can I have volunteers that can pass out communion this morning? Okay, one more. 